All right, good afternoon, ladies. This screencast is going to take us through almost the end of chapter uh, 11. I'm going to say free labor for tomorrow in class. We are comparing slavery in the 18th and 19th centuries. Consider that the 18th century would refer to the 1700s, so kind of like what was experienced during the revolutionary era and immediately following to like what it transitions to in the 1800s, which is the point we're talking about in Unit 3. So throughout the 18th century, slavery was argued as a necessary evil that would eventually wither away. Um, people like Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers, was hopeful that's what would happen. But of course, that is not the case at all. Um, abolition movements had already begun to take root in the northern states. We've already kind of discussed that northern states had begun changing their constitutions um, to abolish slavery. So abolition kind of refers to the movement to want to abolish and end slavery in the United States. Um, abolition also had begun taking roots on like an international level. Countries like Great Britain, France, in the late 18th century made moves to begin freeing and abolishing slavery. Um, during the 18th century, Blacks were able to sustain their own cultural identities. They had strong family ties. Um, they even formed uh, ties amongst um, non-blood relatives. Kinships, really, is what they called those, but kind of adopted family members. Um, even though family members could be bought and sold at any time, they will still kind of develop these cultures and these tight relationships and bonds with each other. They will pass down traditions, family names, knowledge about their previous experiences and their religious beliefs, etc. In terms of resistance, um, slaves often practiced silent forms of resistance. They didn't have very many large-scale revolts, but they would often like break tools. They would work slowly um, to prevent the plantation owner from making as much profit. Um, Large-scale revolts, like I said, are few. We've kind of discussed a couple, um, like Stono, but many slaves recognized they just didn't have the numbers or resources to be successful um, in a revolt. They also knew that the southern white population would come together and probably put the rebellion down. Um, but that's just a little bit of a comparison introduction into what slavery was looking like in the 1700s, and now we'll kind of compare that to the 19th century. So in the 19th century, slavery ends up expanding even more. Despite the whole wither away hope or theory, um, it's going to grow even to even larger extremes. By this point, the majority of slaves were American-born. Laws were implemented to regulate both slaves and free blacks. Um, so regardless if you were a free African in the North or a slave in the South, there were laws in place to restrict your kind of social mobility. Um, examples of these laws, um, no marriages were permitted, no literacy was encouraged, um, no voting rights, they couldn't freely move or travel on their own, etc. Slavery was extensively used within the antebellum South. Antebellum, by the way, is an adjective for like pre-Civil War South, as part of the national economy. Um, roughly 25% of Southern households owned slaves in the South. Um, most uh, households only had one slave, but the top 10% of slave owners uh, did have um, 12 plus, like over 12. That's the top 10% like wealth-wise. There is a difference as well between the slave experience, depending on which region of the South the slave was living and working. Um, and so these two regions would be defined as the Upper South, which are your more, you know, they're your Southern states, but like the Northern Southern states, like think Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Virginia. Um, and the, the other alternative is the Cotton or Deep South. Uh, for the Upper South, life is easier for the slaves overall, not easy, but easier compared. Um, crops were not as in high of demand to uh, the um, farmers and plantation owners, so they, they're not overworked. The slaves themselves aren't overworked, so they couldn't afford to be overworked. 
Um, planters would allow their slaves to work using the task system, where each day slaves would be given like certain jobs, certain responsibility. Um, once the assignment they were given was completed, then they're free to kind of go to their quarters and do their own thing. Now, life for slaves in the Cotton South, the Deep South, was very different. Um, cotton was in high demand, and the U.S. was supplying most of the world's cotton at this point in history. The goal of cotton planters was to raise cotton, make money, buy more slaves, make more cotton, sell more, etc. So slaves are being worked consistently from sunup to sundown. Owners tended to be a little more brutal in the Deep South or the Cotton South as far as physical punishment, um, whipping for slow work or disobedience. And they would use, instead of the task system, as in the Upper South, they would use the gang labor system, where groups of slaves would work together under the supervision of an overseer that would often use threats and physical whip, uh, whippings to keep up the work pace. So their job is never considered done, and they are highly overworked. I wanted to quickly address the perspective of slaveholders at this time. Um, so people who owned slaves, what is their argument or defense for their position of owning slaves? Some saw slavery as a positive good. Um, the landowner, the plantation owner, the slave owner would argue that, hey, we got them out of Africa. Um, they made them Christians, they take care of them, um, so that's, we're doing a good thing here. Another way of looking at this kind of justification from their perspective, again, not us justifying it, it's what they would, how they would sleep at night, how they choose to justify their actions. They said slavery was a form of paternal benevolence. Um, Paternal benevolence refers to this idea that many slave owners saw themselves as somewhat paternalistic, almost father figures to their slaves, saying that they provided food, shelter to their, their slave populations. They believe that these people are inherently inferior to them, that they would not be able to take care of themselves without the slave owner taking care of them for them. Um, so they feel like they're helping them, um, which is similar to that. Um, kind of po a positive good argument. Um, this is obviously very backwards, but this is how the Southern own, uh, slave owners are trying to um, justify their actions. Slaves are still able to maintain their cultural identity in the 19th century, very similarly to that they were doing in the 18th century. And I just wanted to uh, touch on the fact that the expansion of slavery in the South is just going to fuel the opposition movement to slavery in other parts of the world and the country specifically. So like the more the South pushed and grew the institution of slavery, the more the North is going to want to fight back, which is going to kind of highlight that um, difference um, and growing difference between those two regions in our country. All right, I know that was quick, but we're done with that. Please write down any questions you have, and I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good day.